Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to South Africa, if you're from outside South Africa. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, say a few words at this uh, important uh, conference. Um, I should probably start by saying just what perspective I come from so you know what you're going to get from me. Uh, I'm an activist, uh, a human rights activist. Uh, I run a legal organization which is called Section 27. And Section 27 is a reference to Section 27 of the South African Constitution, which I will talk a little bit to. Uh, it's an organization of lawyers, uh, although I'm not a lawyer myself. But I'm a firm believer in the power of law when it is combined with activism and with social mobilization in bringing about change and dignity. Uh, I'm going to talk about the issue of access to affordable medicines in South Africa and the problems and opportunities that are presented by our patent uh, regime. Uh, but in order to do that, I want to situate uh, my speech in the now. And as you cannot help but see and hear, uh, the now of South Africa this week is the now of the death of our great hero, uh, Nelson Mandela, and a now of uh, enormous uh, national outpouring uh, in respect for what his contribution was to South Africa in all of the years of his political life. And I think Mandela's life is relevant to what I would like to say really from two points. One is that whilst Mandela as president failed to lead the country on AIDS in the years of his presidency, in the years after his presidency, he became one of the loudest global voices on the need to have high level political response to HIV and AIDS, but also on the rights of people with HIV to have access to affordable and to life-saving medicines. So that was one characteristic of Mandela. The second characteristic of Mandela was his commitment to South Africa's supreme law, the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, which was signed on the 10th of December, 1996 and which is a law that has to govern all laws and to which, with which all laws have to comply, including laws governing intellectual property, patents, and so on and so on. And it's bringing those two issues together that I want to do in my presentation. How do we link issues of the AIDS epidemic to the manner in which the South African government was legally required to overcome the barriers to treating people with HIV and remains legally uh, responsible for, for overcoming those barriers. So let me start by saying a little bit about HIV, assuming that there's some people in this room who are not fully aware of why access to affordable medicines is such an issue for the democratic South Africa. You probably are aware that South Africa has the most serious HIV epidemic in the world. There are 6.5 million people in South Africa who live with HIV out of our population of about 50 million people. There are, even as we speak, 1,000 new HIV infections per day. 1,000 new infections per day. And HIV still kills about 150,000 people per year in this country. So it's an enormous challenge to development in South Africa, uh, and it's an enormous social uh, burden on, on our country. Now, HIV was first detected in South Africa in 1993, but when treatment started to become available in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, one of the most immediate barriers to 
access to treatment was the affordability of antiretroviral medicines. And the reasons for the barriers of affordability were to do with the heavy patenting of antiretroviral medicines. And back in 2001, 2002, a year's supply of antiretroviral medicines, all patented at that time, cost approximately 100,000 rand per person. Today, a year's supply of antiretroviral medicines costs just over 1,000 rand per person. And so the first challenge that the democratic government in South Africa faced was how do you deal with these issues of intellectual property and how does South Africa as a democratic and developing country try to position itself to be in a position to afford to supply people with, with essential medicines. Now you may remember, you know, whilst we're all celebrating all over the world the legacy of Mandela, the first thing the pharmaceutical companies did globally, the research-based pharmaceutical companies, was in 1998 to try to interdict the South African government when the South African government passed an amendment to the medicines and related substances, uh, what was called the Medicines and Related Substances Amendment Act. 39 international pharmaceutical companies went to court to try to block the passage of that piece of legislation. That piece of legislation sought to do very simple and very lawful things. It sought to introduce into our Medicines Act the right of the government to utilize parallel importation of medicines, and it sought to make explicit within our Patents Act the right to compulsory licensing, and it made generic substitution of off-patent medicines mandatory at the point of prescription. Nothing particularly controversial about that, and yet that act by the democratic government resulted in a major court battle. Now, eventually those companies withdrew their legal, their attempt to interdict the government. That was mainly because there was a campaign led by the Treatment Action Campaign supported by activists internationally to support the rights of the South African government in this instance, and also as a result of an amicus curiae intervention, a friend of the court intervention into that case by the Treatment Action Campaign, arguing that the sole consideration could not be matters of intellectual property, that the court would have to weigh up, would have to balance IP rights against public health rights and against the South African Constitution. Now, unfortunately, there wasn't a judgment in that matter. The companies withdrew and there was an out-of-court settlement. So we never got legal clarity on just how that balance, uh, ba balance falls. And as I speak today, although I will make a number of uh, bold assertions about how that balance should be understood, we do not have clear judgments out of the South African courts uh, stating exactly what are the rights of government in relation to the rights of, 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 of patent holders. These rights have been asserted in a number of instances. For example, in 2003, there was uh, a case, a complaint laid with the South African Competition Commission using our Competition Act, arguing that patents were being abused by the patent holders, in this case GlaxoSmithKline and Boehringer Ingelheim, that they were using their abusing their monopolies to set excessive prices that had no relationship to the actual costs of the development of those medicines and therefore that they were violating people's rights to health. But again, after a year, after a year of investigation by the, by the Competition Commission, the Competition Commission decided to refer it to the Competition Tribunal, which meant that the Competition Commission had de decided that there was prima facie evidence of an abuse of patent rights, but at the point of reference to the Competition Commission, predictably, those companies realized that it made more sense to bail and to settle. And I think that was a critical turning point in issues of affordability to medicines for South Africa, because in the settlement agreement, they agreed to voluntary licenses on, on, on three, seven voluntary licenses on three medicines, which 
had the effect of introducing competition for antiretroviral medicines into the South African market and then led to a very dramatic and very immediate reduction in the price of those medicines, making them affordable for use in the public health care sector. As a result of that clash, today in South Africa, we have the largest antiretroviral treatment program in the world. There are 2.4 million people officially. I don't believe those figures, uh, um, but that's another discussion. But there are 2.4 million people officially receiving medicines on a daily basis through public health facilities because those medicines have become affordable and because the IP barriers have been overcome. But that isn't the end of the story. Because as those of you who understand HIV will know, whilst there are affordable what's called first-line regimens, second- and third-line regimens are far more expensive. And second- and third-line medicines are far more patented up and therefore far more inaccessible and unaffordable to the South African government. So the, cha the, 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 the challenge that we face as we go into the future and as more and more people need those medicines is how do we deal with the IP barriers that inhibit access to life-saving medication. The final point I'd like to make on this, though, is that AIDS is not exceptional as a cause of disease and illness in South Africa, and therefore AIDS medicines are not exceptional, and therefore issues around intellectual property are not limited to issues around IP on AIDS medicines. We face similar problems in relation to medicines for tuberculosis. Oh, five minutes left. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> We face similar problems in relation to medicines for cancer, and perhaps in the discussion some of my colleagues will give you the facts and figures on those, on, on those, those medicines. But this is, again, an instance where price is inflated as a consequence of patents, and where South Africa faces the problem of being one of the most patent-bound countries in the world. Now, I want to use my last uh, five minutes uh, to just talk... <coughs> about how should we respond to this in a way that is lawful in terms of the, of the constitution, of the South African constitution, and also a little bit about South Africa's legal, legal framework. As I said, this is our supreme law, and we're fortunate that section 27 of this says everyone in South Africa has a right, everyone, the word is everyone, to have access to healthcare services. And it goes on to say that the state must take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to progressively realize that right. Now, as lawyers or pretend lawyers, the way we interpret that is to mean that the state has a positive duty to tackle the barriers to health. It can't just sit back and say, well, we've got a problem with the price of medicines and there's nothing we can do about it. There is a, a positive injunction on the state in the South African constitution to, to, to deal, with those, to deal with, with, with those issues. The problem is that in South Africa, we have seen only partial attempts to deal with the problem. The problem is more a political one than a legal one, because as with many developing country governments, there is a fear of offending the powerful developed countries of the United States and the European Union. And that fear inhibits even lawful, reasonable action to ensure that barriers created by IP are overcome. So really, the only serious attempt to act on what is permissible under the TRIPS regime was the attempt to amend the Medicines and Related Substances Amendment Act in 1997, an act which sits on the statute books, but which has never been used for the purposes of parallel importation or compulsory licensing, at least. Generic substitution is now standard practice in South Africa, and that has had a significant effect in bringing prices down, but those other powers have not been used. Our Patents Act and our general policy around intellectual property has lagged behind the rights that states have against intellectual property or in the context of intellectual property regimes. So consequently, we have no system of patent review. Again, my colleagues will give you the facts. It's somewhere in the notes that they prepared for me. But in 2008, for example, South Africa granted 2,442 pharmaceutical patents uh, compared to 278 that were granted by Brazil. 
So there's no system of review. It's a depository system. Patentability criteria are very lax. There is no system or opportunity for pre-grant opposition. And in terms of the Patents Act, the process for granting compulsory licenses is, com is, is cumbersome and is, is not being utilized. The result of that, as I've said, two minutes left, is very high prices on medicines across the board, uh, exceptionally high prices, and no benefits. None of the benefits that are alleged to come from high respect for intellectual property regimes have come to South Africa. In fact, what has happened is exactly the opposite. Since 1994, 35 pharmaceutical companies have closed down their production in South Africa. 35 research-based international pharmaceutical companies have closed down. So where is the innovation that is said to come from respect for intellectual property rights? There has been a growth of generic production, but the growth of generic production and innovation has largely been in the field of HIV and AIDS because obviously those companies have spotted the very large market that exists uh, because of the, 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 large, the large epidemic. So in con I want to conclude, however, by just mentioning the following. We see a ray of light, although yesterday we had a round table with our government officials and I wasn't quite sure how bright that ray was uh, <laughs> after listening to them. Um, but the Department of Trade and Industry in South Africa has, uh, in September of this year, published a new policy on intellectual property, on various aspects of intellectual property, including intellectual property as it comes with regards to access to medicines. And it is a progressive, reasonable, uh, lawful policy, but what's important about it is that it recognizes public health imperatives that have to be weighed against IP rights. It proposes to utilize fully TRIPS flexibilities, and it proposes to amend South Africa's patent law in order to be able to do so. That policy has drawn ire from the multinational companies. It has been welcomed by the generic uh, local uh, producers of medicines. And the Treatment Action Campaign and our allies are seizing upon that policy to try to utilize it to get a proper, reasonable regime set up in South Africa. I want to conclude on this point. Next year is our 20th anniversary. We will have another election in South Africa, uh, which will be a very interesting election because if you are observing South Africa, you can see there's quite a lot of uh, turmoil in our politics and people are beginning to realize that our president is uh, uh, not an entirely clean, uh, politically clean, uh, uh, uncorrupt individual. Uh, um, uh, but we will raise these issues in the election because, as I've said, for many people, the degree to which medicines are patented and flexibility is not utilized is a matter of life and death. And that is an area where we have to get the change. So that will become an election issue. So thank you very much for listening to me. And if you gave me one extra minute, I appreciate it. Thanks.